Hey everyone and welcome to today's Chemistry Daily Booster. This is number 14 in the series and it is one of those advanced information listed topics. It's listed on both foundation and higher chemistry and there's also one of the practical tasks for the foundation that we're going to cover in this one as well. What we're going to start off with is hopefully a nice simple reminder of what we mean when we talk about pHs of different solutions. So I'm hoping from even all the way back in year seven, you remember that an acid has a pH of less than seven. And if we add universal indicator to an acidic solution, it would go red, orange or yellow. Now, the additional bit for the GCSE is the fact that acids have hydrogen ions released when dissolved in water. Second type of solution we can have is a neutral one. This is a pH of seven and it's the green with universal indicator. And finally, the alkalis pH greater than seven, they go blue or purple with universal indicator solution. And what we actually have here is that they release hydroxide ions, OH minus, when we dissolve them in water. So just make sure we know the pH is the colors with the universal indicator. Acids release hydrogen ions, alkalis release the hydroxide ions. Now, this is the practical bit for those of you doing the foundation. What we usually do to measure pH is we would have used universal indicator solution or universal indicator paper in class. So what we find there is that you add it or dip your paper into it and then it goes a certain color. You then try to match that color to that little printed color chart and it's a nightmare because the colors on the little printed chart don't really match the color that you see in your tube or on the bit of paper. And so there's a fair amount of guesswork as to the actual pH. So that is the basic way that we can do it. If we're looking for how we could improve that method, then we would use this thing called a pH meter. Now a pH meter quite simply is a digital meter you dunk it into your solution and on the screen you'll get a digital readout that tells you exactly what the pH is, usually down to at least one decimal place. So far more accurate, removes the whole human error from trying to judge colours, etc. because it's not subjective anymore. In terms of the technique to use our pH meter, we need to calibrate it first of all. So that means that we place our little pH probe into what we call a calibration buffer. So a solution we know the pH of. If you look at the little screen and it matches, brilliant. If it doesn't, there's a little screw that you adjust just to get it so that it is the right pH on your screen. You then rinse it and then place it in your test solution. Nice and simple to use. So what can they ask us about acids and alkalis and the reactions? Well, the go to neutralization, again, something we've looked at all the way back in key stage three. Neutralization is just the reaction between an acid and a base or an alkali to form salt and water. So this is our general word equation there. OK, so acid plus base makes a salt and water so that that gives us our starting point. Now, when you actually get this, you won't just be able to write the word salt. You will actually have to work out what the salt is. We're going to come on to that in a second. The other bit that has come up before is asking you to work out basically what happens when the hydrogen ions and the hydroxide ions react together. So quite simply, hydrogen ion plus a hydroxide ion makes water. So H plus plus OH minus makes H2O. Now that does leave us with the other ions. So we've got the hydrogen and the hydroxide, but where do we get the other bits? What happens to those? Well, we're going to need to name our salt. So we've said we can't just write the word salt. We need to actually name it. First thing you need to do, learn this table. These are the four acids and the endings for the salts that you need to know. So there's no quick way to this, it's just got to learn it. So hydrochloric acid always makes a chloride, sulfuric acid a sulfate, nitric acid a nitrate, phosphoric acid a phosphate. When we actually write the name of a salt, it has a two part name. So if we just pick, let's just do sodium hydroxide and we're going to react it with nitric acid in this case. So 
the first thing that we actually need to do is we're going to write down the name of the metal. Here is our metal, sodium. So we write sodium down over here. So whatever the metal name is, write that first. The second part comes from the acid. In this case, we've got nitric acid. So we hopefully have learnt that nitric acid always makes a nitrate. So we then write nitrate. And that's the name of the salt, sodium nitrate. We'd obviously then have to write down that we also make water. That's it. So however they phrase it, then if you need to name a salt, it's always going to be the same thing. Metal name first and then look at the acid to get your ending. Second type of reaction we need to know, carbonates and acids. Now carbonates are ionic compounds and they contain the carbonate ion. Remember those compound ions we looked at in an earlier booster? Here it is, CO3 2 minus, the carbonate ion. Our general word equation is here, metal carbonate plus acid makes a salt plus water plus carbon dioxide. Obviously, we would know the metal carbonate and the acid from the question. We would then have to work out the name of the salt, just as we did. And then we just write plus water plus carbon dioxide. Don't forget the carbon dioxide, because if we've got a carbonate ion, we've got carbon that needs to go somewhere. And it does go into the carbon dioxide. Now, in terms of our carbonates, then what we find is that most of them are insoluble in water. That means they won't dissolve. There are exceptions, the group one carbonates and ammonium carbonate. So as long as you know group one and ammonium carbonates do dissolve, none of the others will. If we wanted to prove that carbon dioxide is made, then we would need to do the test for carbon dioxide. And this is where we've got lime water and it goes from colourless to cloudy. Now, the key word here is colourless. Don't say clear because clear just means there's no bits floating in it. Colourless means it has no colour. So you must use the word colourless. Cloudy, there are other exceptions, uh, accepted answers here. So we would have milky is also acceptable there. So cloudy or milky is fine, but colourless is the only option for the starting point. And don't forget to say it's lime water that we use. Third reaction, metals and acids. They make a salt and hydrogen. So again, we bring in one of our gas tests, this time testing for hydrogen. Lit splint makes a squeaky pop. Okay, so do make sure that you've said the splint is lit and that it is a squeaky pop sound that we make. Again, the name of our salt here, we can work out because we copy the name of the metal, look at the acid, that gives us the ending. Don't forget to add hydrogen. If they're giving us a balanced symbol equation here, don't forget that hydrogen is diatomic. So don't just write plus H and try and balance it because you're missing that little two, then it will always be wrong. Never write always H2. So just watch out for that one. We're now going to consider the idea of concentration because there's two terms we're going to associate with acids and concentration is the first. What we're talking about with the acids we use in school labs, these are solutions. So they are basically a solute dissolved in a solvent. The greater the amount of solute, the greater the concentration. So two terms we could use here, dilute or concentrated. If something is dilute, it means that there is a low ratio of acid to the volume of the solution. If it is concentrated, it has a high ratio of the acid to the volume of the solution. So concentrated acids have a high ratio of acid to volume, or they've got a high mass of solute dissolved in a relatively small volume of the actual solution. The second term is all about strength. As we've already said, our acids are going to release these hydrogen ions when they're in solution. Now, what we actually find here is a covalent bond has to break between that hydrogen and the other part of the substance. So there'll be a negative ion made up of the rest of the acid. Depending on how many hydrogen ions the acid releases, that's going to tell us the strength. Now, there's another way we phrase this, which is how ionized it is. 
we would have either weak acids or strong acids. Weak acids are only partially ionized, so that means it's only really some of the hydrogen ions, whereas a strong acid is fully ionized. That tells us all of the hydrogen ions have been released. So strong acids, fully ionized, weak acid, partially ionized. We will always be able to spot a weak acid because of our reversible reaction sign. So here's our little example at the top as to what's happening in terms of the ionization process. So there is the full acid molecule, here are the hydrogen ions, and there's our negative ion. Because we've got this little reversible reaction sign, it means it's only ever going to be partially ionized because these individual ions can reform the whole molecule. Whereas if we look at the one underneath this little example, we've only got a standard arrow, which means it can't then have the hydrogen ions reforming with the nitrate ion to make our nitric acid. So that one will go to completion. It means it's a strong acid. One of the maths questions they can throw in here then, asking you what the new pH of an acid or a solution would be when the hydrogen ions are going to change. Now, the pattern we need to remember is that if the hydrogen ions increase by a factor of 10, the pH decreases by one. So an increase by a factor of 10 leads to a decrease in pH by one. What we mean by that is if we start off with a solution of pH 3 and we're then going to increase the hydrogen ion concentration by 10, that means this is going to go down to pH 2. If we were to have increased it by 100, then that's obviously 2 because that's 10 times 10 gives us 100. So rather than pH 3 by 10, it would obviously be pH 2 by 100 takes down to pH 1 because we've dropped two pH values. Final thing, just the, what we can also do when we're recording pH is that we can plot what we call a pH titration curve because this actually shows us what happens to the pH during a neutralization reaction. So this is our little pH curve over here and what we would actually be able to do is we can read off the exact volume at which it is neutralized because it is in this line here where you get that vertical drop. So wherever that is, you can read off in this case, it's 25 centimeters cubed and get the volume of your acid needed to be neutralized. Last thing to do for today then is head on over and have a go at today's quiz. Obviously, if there are bits you're not 100% certain on, do take the time to revisit those either in your own notes, your revision guides, look at the videos on the main channel, and do have a little look through some past papers as well, just to get a feel for the style of questions here. Don't forget to join us again tomorrow for our next Chemistry Daily Booster.